Can't get enough of New Horizons? Neither can we, or anyone else. That's why we're back to help you make your island even more stellar with 107 more facts about Animal Crossing New Horizons. Find a comfy mum cushion or tire toy to settle down on, and let's get started. Sydney, don't forget to mention that there was an announcement yesterday for Animal Crossing, but since it was yesterday, we couldn't put all of the stuff in this video, uh, so we're just gonna have to make another video. You already know New Horizons was a huge hit for Nintendo. But just how huge? In just its first week, New Horizons sold 13.1 million copies. That's more copies than Wild World and New Leaf sold in their entire life spans. And New Horizons still has a long life ahead of it. Ever since Leaf showed up on Nature Day, he's sold six different types of shrubs. Camellia, Azalea, Hydrangea, Hibiscus, Tea Olive, and Holly. Each shrub comes in two colors and has a blooming period of about a month and a half to two months, and their blooms don't overlap. Shrubs are cool and everything, but Leaf's real blessing is the flowers he sells. After over a month, players could finally get flowers that weren't native to their island and without having to visit someone else. And if you're really strapped for cash, Leaf buys weeds for double their normal price. Yes, you can sell them to him for 20 bells instead of 10. My loan is as good as paid off. Red is also back. This time, he's rebranded himself as Jolly Red and runs his shop out of a boat. That treasure trawler always docks at that weird, secret-feeling rocky beach that every island has on its north coast. Red has been in every single Animal Crossing game, but to get him to appear in New Horizons, you have to donate at least 60 items to your museum. I mean, that includes everything, fossils, fish, and bugs combined. So you were probably well past this point by the time Red was introduced. When Red first shows up, Isabel will alert you that a shady figure is roaming around your island. If you buy a painting from him, the first painting is guaranteed to be genuine, and you can donate it to the new art gallery in the museum. But don't get used to it. Like always, Red is trying to pawn off fake art as the genuine article. Once he sets up his treasure trawler, there is literally no chance that all four pieces he's selling are real. There's a 50% chance that he's selling three fakes and one genuine work, but that number shifts every time he visits. There's even a 10% chance he's selling one fake and three reels, or four fakes. Even if you spot the real deal every time, it's going to take a while to fill your art wing. Statistically speaking, there's only a 20% chance that Red will be selling a real painting or sculpture that you don't already have. Yeah, don't think New Horizons wouldn't give you the same real painting twice. It would, and it does. Remember, you can only buy one piece of art per visit. And of course, Red will quickly state there's no refunds. Blathers won't accept fake art into the museum, and Timmy and Tommy won't even buy them from you. At least you can decorate your house with them, right? Just don't invite any art critics over. Every painting and statue in New Horizons is based on real-life artwork. You can tell the art is fake because it makes changes to the piece that it's based on. Some are pretty obvious, but others can be pretty hard to spot. That art history degree is finally paying off. Look at me now, mom and dad. Some paintings even have more than one fake version. I know, I know. I'm also sweating bullets every time I visit Red. But just remember that there are a few artworks like Van Gogh's sunflowers that are always genuine. Buying fake art is bad enough, but some of the fake art is haunted. Yeah, haunted. If you interact with them at night, they freaking move or grin or blink or seep through the canvas. Ugh. If you don't want to risk buying haunted artwork, you can still buy two pieces of furniture on the treasure trawler. While they're a bit overpriced, Red's furniture will be in rare colors that usually aren't found on your island. There is one other way to get artwork in New Horizons, but it's even less reliable than Red. Very occasionally, one of your villagers may gift you some art in the mail. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's real. In fact, the current hypothesis is that a smug villager will only give you fake art. If it's a clear night on your island, there's a chance that Celeste may come and visit, and she'll definitely show up if there's a meteor shower. Talk to her to get one of her exclusive coveted DIY recipes, which come from one of three sets. Wand recipes, astrological recipes, like the tourist hub, and space recipes, like the flying saucer. The recipe you receive will be randomly selected. You can craft the astrological recipes, aka the zodiac set, with special zodiac star fragments that only fall during that zodiac sign's calendar dates, and each fragment has their own special furniture. For example, the Taurus fragments only fall between April 20th and May 20th, and you can use them to craft the Taurus bathtub. I'm looking forward to that Scorpio lamp. Also, quick quality of life tip, you can mash the A button to make that crafting animation much faster. It's a godsend when you have to craft like 10 fish bait in one go. Celeste won't appear on a dark, stormy night, but there's a chance that Wisp will show up anytime the sun goes down. He might even be there the same night as Celeste. When you talk to Wisp, you'll scare him so bad that his ghost bits will scatter randomly around the island. You might have to run a few laps to find them all. 
Once you've returned all five pieces of Wisp Spirit to him, he'll offer to give you something new or something expensive. Pro tip, always get something new. Wisp even admits he's not all that good at gauging an item's value. Like one player chose something expensive and then got the game's default wallpaper. So just save yourself the trouble. If you're a sadist, you can collect all of Wisp's pieces, run back to him, and then refuse to cough them up. But don't push him. If you taunt Wisp enough, he'll warn you one last time. And then he'll just repeat himself until you give him the pieces. I guess being stuck in a purgatory of looping dialogue is its own punishment. Because CJ and Flick refer to each other as partner, many players have hoped that means more than just business partners. The jury's still out on that one, but the New Horizons strategy guide does mention that CJ and Flick are roommates. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going on. Despite their beautiful bond, it seems like Flick's bias for bugs over fish stands out in his statues. For instance, his Atlas Moth statue is a majestic and giant Grand Atlas Moth. It's bigger than the actual bug. On the other hand, his statue for the coelacanth, a fish that's bigger than your villager, is just a pitifully tiny statue. Whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere, CJ has already hosted a fishing tourney by now. The tourney happens once every season, which means once every three months on the second Saturday of the month. You can participate in the fishing tourney as many times as you want, and you'll earn points depending on how many fish you catch. You can trade 10 points for a variety of fish-themed prizes, like a fishing cooler, a fishing rod stand, and even a fish wand. Once you've gotten every item once, you'll start getting the same prizes over again. So keep fishing if you want enough drying racks for your fish market. CJ keeps track of how many points you've earned and will give a trophy if you reach certain thresholds. 100 points will earn you a bronze fishing trophy, 200 gets silver, and 300 points nets you the golden trophy. If you didn't manage to win every trophy last time, then don't sweat it. Your point total will carry over into the next tournament, so you'll eventually earn that gold with enough hard work and fishing rods. Flick's bug off only kicks off during the summer, and then happens on the fourth Saturday of the month for four consecutive months. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, then that means the bug off is June 27th. But those of you in the Southern Hemisphere have to wait until November. The fishing tourney and bug off work essentially the same way. You'll pay 500 bells to catch as many bugs or fish as you can, which earns you points that you can then exchange for exclusive prizes. And yes, you can still sell your catches to CJ or Flick for the usual 150% price. Everybody knows that you can only catch coelacanth in the rain, but the highly priced fish has another requirement too. Even if it's raining, it won't spawn in the rain unless you've made at least 100 catches. Now that summer's here, in the Northern Hemisphere at least, you can catch sharks to make some serious bells. Most sharks are only available between 4 p.m. and 9 a.m., but you'll have a better chance of catching them on a mystery island. You may even land on an island that only has fins. Yes, you can always tell a fish is a shark by the fin sticking out of the water, but don't get your hopes up too much. Instead of a great white, it could be a sucker fish that only sells for a measly 2,500 bells. There's plenty of new river fish too. You never know when that shadow could be an arowana. That'll earn you a nice 10K. And there's no mistaking the colossal shadow of the arapaima. This river monster is also worth a cool 10K. New fish also means new bugs. Keep an eye on your coconut trees for goliath beetles. You can sell them for a solid 8,000. Just don't do what I did and release them to make room for rainbow stags. Those rainbows were worth 10K in new leaf, but now they're only worth 6K. Do your research. I mean, that's why, that's why you're here, right? I mentioned Finn Island before, but there's also a new mystery island that's a haven for catching those tree-dwelling bugs. It's basically Bamboo Island, but with regular trees instead of bamboo. There's also a version that has cliffs, but both are perfect for stocking up on those valuable goliath beetles and rainbow stags. Also, every mystery island with normal trees has a piece of furniture waiting to be shaken out, so make sure you shake every tree to get it before you head back home. And have your net equipped. You never know if you shake a bunch of wasps loose. Thankfully, the wasps in New Horizons are much more forgiving than the old angry bees of past Animal Crossings. No joke, I once shook a wasp's nest loose, ran a few steps, switched to my bug net, and still managed to catch them before they stung me. Summertime also brings a slew of new DIY recipes. The big ingredient this summer is, fittingly, summer shells. You'll find them along the beach with other shells, but you can tell them apart by their distinct blue hue. You can use them to make stuff like a shell wreath, a shellfish pochette, and an underwater flooring. Mabel and Sable's sister, Lebel, will occasionally visit your island too. Since New Leaf, she started a career as a fashion designer with her own label, Lebel. Lebel will ask you to build an outfit around a particular theme, and she'll even give you a piece of clothing to get you started. The more correctly themed items you wear, the better your reward. Just wearing the item she gives you will get you a single Able Sisters coupon. Two will get you two coupons, and three will get you the coupons and a Lebel item that she'll send in the mail. Every player has different colors, but Labelle gives you the same color every time. For example, 
I have a Purple Label coat and Purple Label sneakers. But don't worry, the more themed items you build into your outfit, the more your friendship with Label will increase. Once that happens, the Label items she gives you will start popping up at the Able Sisters in different colors. Label's great and all, but do yourself a favor and make friends with Sable by talking to her every day. Even if you don't care about her family's life story, you heartless monster. You'll still get access to some exclusive patterns that Sable designed herself. May kicked off, appropriately enough, with May Day. You got a special May Day ticket that you could use to go to the one-time only May Day Island tour. The whole island was organized like a maze, and you had to use the limited resources on the island to make it to the end. At the end of the maze, you got to meet Rover, a longtime veteran of the Animal Crossing series. He even gave you a reward, his briefcase. If you perfectly navigated the maze, you could also pick up a number of bell vouchers for some easy cash. International Museum Day ran from May 18th to the 31st. The bug, fossil, and fish exhibits in the museum each hosted a stamp rally, and your reward for finding all three stamps in each exhibit was the corresponding plaque. You could do the stamp rally every day if you wanted to, for whatever reason. The reward was the same every day, but I'm not gonna judge you if you really wanted like 10 golden bug plaques. I mean, you do you. Immediately after Museum Day was over, New Horizons entered its longest running seasonal event to date. Wedding season! It runs for the entire month of June and takes place in Photopia on Harv's Island. The seasonal characters for wedding season are Reese and Cyrus, who debuted in New Leaf as the co-owners of the retail store. Cyrus is still making furniture, but now they're celebrating their anniversary and need your help crafting a romantic photo. Reese will rate your photo, and depending on your score, you will receive a certain amount of heart crystals. You can take those right over to Cyrus in exchange for exclusive wedding day items. There are 26 items in all, including a freaking pipe organ. Reese and Cyrus will give you a different prompt every time you visit, like the wedding ceremony or the wedding reception. If you return every day, you'll get more than just heart crystals. For hitting certain day milestones, you can expect rewards like a photo plate, a DIY recipe for a wedding fence, and even a wand. Having a wand is great, but you don't need one to change your outfit on the fly. Just carry around a storage-type item, pop it down, and you'll be able to change your wardrobe right on the spot. Nothing beats taking your fridge to the beach to change into a bright red froggy suit. In addition to all of these NPCs and seasonal characters, you can encounter another kind of special being in New Horizons, aliens. If you watch your in-game TV at 3.33 a.m. on Saturday, you'll see static and a mysterious broadcast that's exactly one minute long. Aliens aside, whenever you turn on a TV, you'll be treated to a completely functional television channel. It's got a set 24-hour schedule with all kinds of programs, including a kids' show, a drama, a cartoon, a documentary, a variety show. There's even tons of commercials, including a seasonal commercial. What's more, if you turn on your TV on a weekday at 6.30 p.m. or Saturday at 6.45, you'll be treated to a weather forecast. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but the weather forecast will tell you if there's a meteor shower that night. There's tons of villagers in New Horizons but they can each be boiled down into one of eight different personality types. Male villagers can be cranky, lazy, jock, or smug, while female villagers can be normal, peppy, snooty, or sisterly, also known as uchi. Each personality type has a set catalog of DIYs they can give you if you walk into them working at their workshop. To maximize your options, make sure you have one of every personality type and snoop around three times a day, the morning, the afternoon, and night. That way, you'll get three different DIYs every day, hopefully new ones. Getting the reactions is a bit more of a grind than you'd think. Beyond the first four reactions, all other reactions can only be taught by one of the eight villager personality types. For each personality type, there's a reaction that can only be learned once you've attained a high level of friendship with that type of villager. There's a lot to that friendship metric too. All the villagers start at level one and each new level comes with a new benchmark action. For instance, at level four, you can change a villager's catchphrase. At level five, they can gift you a photo of themselves. At the highest level, level six, they can trade furniture with you. You can increase your friendship with villagers by talking to them every day, agreeing to sell them an item, catching their fleas and giving them gifts. Different gifts result in different amounts of points, with furniture being worth the most. Wrapping a gift and or giving something worth over 10,000 bells results in an additional point too. Another pro tip, giving a villager clothing always gets you one point, but if you want the full two points, make sure to give them something they'd really like. For example, give the jocks, like your boy Flip, a soccer uniform. There are ways to lower your friendship level, so beware. If you gift a villager garbage, push them, or hit them with your net, they'll become upset and your score will actively dip a couple points. We've all got that one villager we want to move out. There's a common theory that ignoring a villager is the best way to make them move, but that's actually not the case. You get a point for talking to your villager every day, but points don't get subtracted for not talking to them. Basically, avoiding them is a neutral move. 
While a villager with a low friendship score is a little more likely to move out, the hard truth is that it's pretty random. High friendship only makes it slightly less likely that a villager will ask to leave. My best, best boy, Flip, has asked to move out twice. Both times, the answer was no. There's a few other factors at play. A villager can't move if they've had their birthday within seven days, if their house is being moved, if they were the last villager to pop the moving question, or if they were the last one to move in. And no, talking to Isabel has literally zero effect on whether your villager will move out. If you use an amiibo card to invite a villager, you'll be able to manually choose who they replace. However, if you invite someone from your campsite, the villager the camper replaces is selected randomly. If you don't like the pick, all you can do is immediately immediately shut down the game before it saves and try again, and again, and again. Between Amiibo, Mystery Islands, and campsites, villager turnover has hit a new level in New Horizons. A whole vibrant community has popped up that's centered around trading villagers to get exactly who they want. Everyone's trying to trade bells and Nook Miles tickets to fill their island with dreamies, aka their personal dream villagers. In every Animal Crossing game, certain villagers are more popular than others, but no one was ready for this Raymond fever. He debuted in New Horizons as Animal Crossing's first smug cat, and he has a black market all on his own. Really, look it up. He is worth millions of bells and or hundreds of Nook Miles tickets. None of the villagers exclusive to New Horizons have amiibo yet, and that's part of why Raymond is in such high demand. I mean, there's also his eyes, and his willingness to wear a maid outfit. In fact, one popular black market site says half of all total inquiries are just for Raymond. However, one noble hacker decided this whole Raymond craze was getting a little dark, so he offered to give Raymond out for free. He estimates he gave out about 30 Raymonds, and yes, it's too late now. There are definitely more villagers who are wildly popular though. Expect to shell out some serious bells if you're looking for Marshall, Audie, Anka, Bob, Merengue, Coco, Stitches, Bo, and Fauna, for example. Due to all this demand, Amiibo and Amiibo cards are now fetching a ridiculous premium price. Some villagers' Amiibo cards are going for 100 real-life dollars. There's also an underground scene of bootleg Amiibo cards. Other than eBay, a few websites have popped up to help the community exchange villagers, items, and DIY recipes, usually using bells and or Nook Miles as tender. The most known and reliable are Nook.Market and Nookazon. Nookazon, in particular, has 270,000 users per day. With that many people online, you don't know who's willing to do what just to get Raymond. That's why you should protect yourself with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN encrypts your data and reroutes your internet connection through a secure server, so you can safely browse any and all Animal Crossing markets. It even masks your IP address, so you don't have to worry about the more rabid Raymond fans DDoSing you to get a competitive edge. Even Dodo codes are being linked back to your IP address, so make sure your connection is protected. I've never heard of an Animal Crossing DDoS, but you don't want to be the first. And since ExpressVPN hides your IP address, you can use it to access region-locked content. For example, I always put Netflix on in the background when I play Animal Crossing. Trouble is, I can't watch Rick and Morty on Netflix since I live in the States. Well, when I use ExpressVPN, I just say I'm in the UK, and boom, I can fish for sharks, hunt for scorpions, and watch Rick and Morty until I fall asleep. Also, don't forget, ExpressVPN works on your router too, so your Switch is protected. Want to try it yourself? Find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description box below. ExpressVPN.com slash the leaderboard. Villagers aren't the only thing changing hands in New Horizons. There's also a booming stock market. Thanks to dedicated websites like Turnip Exchange and Twitter, you can always find out when someone else has a high turnip price. Like, players started to expect a ridiculous 500% return on their turnip investment every week. That's unheard of in the older Animal Crossing games. Between turnips, time traveling, and making your own tarantula island, the economy of New Horizons became noticeably inflated. Nintendo tried to balance things out by lowering the interest rate on a player's in-game savings account, but it was definitely too late by then. Farming tarantulas, or scorpions now, got even harder with the Nature Day update. Sure, water bugs were bad enough, but the spawn rates of scorpions and tarantulas are now less than half of what they used to be. Even other money-making bugs like Atlas moths or emperor butterflies now appear less often. I'm sure you know that NPCs or villagers will respond to you when you use your reactions, but Orville has a completely unique possibility. If you use the apologetic reaction near Orville, he may start crying. That's because, quote, he never wants a patron of Dodo Airlines to feel unhappy. Too bad there's not a hug reaction. I'm still collecting those 30 rusted parts to make that awesome robot hero. Only one rusted part only appears in your recycling bin after Gulliver shows up on your island. Gulliver rarely visits, but there is a way to get more rusted parts. If you're willing to sacrifice your souvenir, keep Gulliver's communication parts in your pocket overnight. They'll turn into rusted parts the next day. Aside from souvenirs and rusted parts, helping Gulliver eventually pays off. 
After you give him a hand 30 times, Gulliver will send you one of the most sought after items in the game, the DIY recipe for a golden shovel. For the record, golden tools are different in New Horizons. They do eventually break. It just takes way longer compared to the normal tools. Getting the golden ax is a lot easier. All you need to do is break 100 axes, and that can be any kind of ax, even flimsy axes. So if you're dying for the golden ax, just craft a bunch of flimsy axes and start chewing through some trees. Once you've shot down 300 balloons, a golden balloon will eventually float by. Shoot it down, and your gift from the sky will be the DIY recipe for the golden slingshot. Luckily, it's easy to track how many balloons you've shot down. It's also a milestone in the It's Raining Treasure Nook Miles goal. But what if you miss the golden balloon? Does that mean you have to shoot down another 300 balloons? Or maybe you'll never get the golden slingshot? Okay, don't, don't panic. The golden balloon will show up again. It just may take a few days, but it will eventually come back. The recipes for the golden fishing rod and golden net are simple to earn, but unfortunately, much harder. You'll have to complete your critterpedia for fish and bugs, respectively. And then there's a the golden watering can. One beautiful day, you'll ask Isabelle about your island's rating. She'll let you know you've finally achieved five stars, and she'll give you the DIY recipe for the golden watering can as a token of your achievement. With the golden watering can, you'll be able to water nine flowers at once. Just stand on one, have two on your sides, and six in front of you. Boom, that's nine flowers in one go. It sure is an upgrade from that pitiful, flimsy watering can. The golden watering can is awesome, but it's not your only reward for getting a five-star island. A lily of the valley, also known as a Jacob's Ladder in previous games, will bloom. The more days in a row that you can maintain a five-star rating, the more likely that another will pop up. So how do you get that five-star island? Well, no one knows for sure. Data miners have guessed that you have to unlock some basics. Terraforming, the Able Sisters, and the upgraded Nook's Cranny. Many suspect that you also need to have 10 villagers, but I got a five-star island with only nine, so take that with a grain of salt. One thing's for sure, you need to have a variety of furniture spaced neatly all around your island. Isabel tells you this straight up. Right now, data miners estimate you need roughly 50-ish DIY made items, 20-ish Nook Miles items, and 40-ish items you can get from the store. Oh, and at least 50 units of fencing. Of course, you won't get that five-star island without some greenery. We're talking around 250 blooming flowers and about 110 trees. But beware, your island score can actually go down if you have too many trees, namely 220. Isabel will let you know if you need to do some logging. Any flower counts towards your island rating, but you can get some cool colors from flower breeding. Some colors are pretty intuitive. For example, red and white tulips make pink tulips. Same goes for roses, cosmos, lilies, hyacinths, and mums. Thing is, not every flower follows that same kind of logic. To get pink windflowers, you need to breed orange and red windflowers together. Like, why? I spent the first month on my island scratching my head, wondering why my red and white windflowers apparently just didn't want to breed. Then I looked it up. And you can't even get pink pansies. Not every flower comes in every color. Only four flower breeds will produce black flowers. Cosmos, lilies, tulips, and roses. To get black flowers, you just have to put a bunch of red flowers together. It's simple enough, and it'll make your haunted cemetery feel that much creepier. Out of all of those black flowers, black roses are especially valuable. If you put them together and water them with a golden watering can, there's a chance that you'll breed some golden roses. You can sell them for a thousand bells apiece. Blue roses sell for just as much, but getting them is more complicated. The key is to make hybrid red roses, which you can get through cross-pollinating purple and orange roses. The red roses that result from those purple and orange roses are hybrid red roses, and cross-pollinating them gives you a small chance of spawning a blue rose. I'm not going to go down the hybrid breeding rabbit hole, just know that every flower breed has its own set of rules, like you need two hybrid red pansies to get purple pansies, and you need two hybrid purple mums to get green mums, and you get the hybrid purples by breeding two hybrid yellows. Basically, Nintendo wants to torture us. And here's the best part. Sometimes, flowers might not breed at all, but you can increase your chances by inviting friends to your island. If you water flowers yourself, there's only a 5% chance a new flower will pop up, but that number goes up with every friend who waters a flower, all the way up to 80% for five friends. If you play solo, don't sweat it. You can improve your odds by one, just planting a ton of different flowers, and two, planting them in a checkerboard pattern. Gotta leave a spot for those new flowers to grow in, you know? Thankfully, if you just want more of the same flower, you can just water a single flower, and it will eventually create a clone of itself. There are no limits to how many flowers can spawn a day in New Horizons, so go nuts. Don't think that you'll be able to breed lilies of the valley, though. Not like they have a lot of use anyway. They don't come in different colors, you can't wear them, and they only sell for 222 bells. Nowhere close to the 1k that blue and gold roses will fetch you. All of those community watering bonuses emphasize the importance of connection with your fellow players. When one player's island had high turnip prices, she tweeted a Dota code. 
Standard practice, right? Well, she got an unexpected guest. Mr. Frodo himself, Elijah Wood. And yeah, he had lovely manners. Elle Wood isn't the only famous New Horizons fan. Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez opened her Twitter DMs for four minutes to allow people to slip Dota codes into her inbox. The Congresswoman then went around making house calls and visiting islands. One constituent even taught her about the Switch app. The next day, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez visited an epidemiologist's graduation ceremony and gave her first ever commencement speech, all in Animal Crossing. Screenwriter Gary Whitta took things a step further. He created and streamed a full in-game talk show called Animal Talking, complete with a drum set playing sidekick and celebrity guests like T-Pain, Danny Trejo, and of course, Elijah Wood. In case you were wondering, T-Pain got into Animal Crossing because his daughter likes it and he tries to keep up with what she's into. He recently gave a reporter a tour of his island and his house, which includes a race car bed, naturally, a sweet arcade, and a studio in his basement that he's nicknamed The Lab, after his real-life basement studio. While we wait for the fall, our friends in the Southern Hemisphere are giving us a taste of what's to come. Look forward to different kinds of mushrooms popping up on your island, as well as maple leaves. The New Horizons strategy guide seems to hint at the eventual return of the much-missed gyroids. With the exception of Lloyd, gyroids have been totally missing. The guide suggests that, like in past Animal Crossing games, you'll be able to dig them up after it rains. What else can we look forward to? Well, according to one data miner who has already predicted updates with shocking accuracy, we can look forward to Brewster's return with a museum cafe, and another upgrade to Nook's Cranny, and diving, and vegetables. In the meantime, New Horizons is still a creative haven, especially when it comes to island layout. One player recreated the map from The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. That's impressive, but only slightly less impressive than turning your island into Danny DeVito's face. I can't wait to see Danny DeVito's face in the fall, but what are some changes that you are looking forward to in Animal Crossing New Horizons? Let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe to the leaderboard. From indie to AAA, we love the games you play. I'm your host, Sydney, and thank you for watching.